Welcome to the world of pulmonary medicine. Bronchitis often follows a viral infection, leading to prolonged cough and wheezing. In such cases, hyperactive airways can be managed effectively with inhaled beta-2 adrenergic agonists, providing relief and improving respiratory function. Interstitial pulmonary fibrosis presents with a non-productive cough and distinctive lung markings. High-resolution chest CT scans are crucial for diagnosis, revealing the characteristic honeycomb pattern. It can also lead to right heart failure, which can lead to functional tricuspid regurgitation. Bronchiectasis is characterized by bronchial thickening and luminal dilatation, often visible in imaging studies. COPD survival can only be improved by smoking cessation and long-term oxygen therapy if low O2 sets. While inhalers reduce exacerbations, Pulmonary rehabilitation significantly enhances the quality of life for patients. Effective COPD management involves categorizing patients based on risk and symptoms. In A and B, patients haven't had more than one exacerbation, whereas in C and D, frequent exacerbation of two or more is present. A has mild symptoms, so PRN albuterol works, whereas B has significant symptoms, so we add scheduled LABA or LAMA. In category C, we have scheduled LABA or LAMA, and in D, we have scheduled LAMA and LABA combined. We do add additional ICS inhaler if frequent exacerbations. Pulmonary rehabilitation plays a vital role, especially in higher risk B to D categories. For COPD patients, air travel safety is determined by oxygen saturation levels. Those with SpO2 above 95% can fly safely, while between 92 to 95 with high risk factors, need hypoxia altitude simulation testing. In patients with less than 92% oxygenation, recommend supplemental oxygen during travel. Alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency should be considered in patients with early-onset emphysema in younger individual without smoking history or unexplained liver disease. Alpha-1 antitrypsin presents with basilar emphysema. Testing for this genetic condition is crucial, as it can lead to significant pulmonary and liver complications if left undiagnosed. Cystic fibrosis, caused by mutations in the CFTR gene, leads to thickened secretions affecting multiple organs, including lung, pancreas, including insufficiency, and diabetes. Diagnosis by positive sweat, chloride testing. Diagnosing pulmonary embolism is by CTPE except in some situations. Ventilation perfusion scanning is used when kidney injury or true contrast allergy or pregnancy or inconclusive CT angiography. Also in chronic pulmonary thromboembolism, VQ scan preferred over CT angiography. In hemodynamic instability, bedside echo can be done to evaluate right heart strain to rule in PEs as a tentative cause to give immediate thrombolytics. Pulmonary hypertension in HFPEF presents with orthopnea, elevated BNP, and dilated left atrium. Management is focused on HFPEF control with diuresis rather than pulmonary HTN meds, which can lead to flash pulmonary edema instead. Fat embolization syndrome, a complication of long bone fractures, presents with respiratory distress, rash, and neurologic symptoms. Early immobilization and supportive care are essential for preventing and managing this condition effectively. Pleural effusions are classified as exudate or transudate based on LIGHTS criteria. If protein in pleura compared to serum is more than 0.5 or LDH in pleura versus serum is more than 0.6, it is exudative effusion. In some situations like diuresis use in CHF, effusion can look exudative. We need to calculate SCAG serum albumin minus pleural albumin, and if this is greater than 1.2, this is transudative effusion. High lymphocytes in pleural fluid along with low pH and high LDH is indicative of rheumatoid arthritis. Low pH in pleural effusions often indicates a high malignant cell burden. Parapneumonic effusions vary from uncomplicated to complicated. Complicated parapneumonic effusion occurs when there is bacterial invasion of the pleural space. These effusions are typically moderate to large in size and may be free-flowing or loculated. Pleural fluid analysis in complicated effusions commonly shows pH less than 7.2, glucose less than 60, white blood cell count greater than 50,000, and LDH, 1,000. Gram stain and culture may be positive or negative. Due to the risk of progression to MPAMA, chest tube placement for drainage is indicated in all cases of complicated parapneumonic effusion.
Management depends on the size and risk features of the effusion. Small, free-flowing effusions, equal 10 mm in thickness, generally do not require drainage and can be managed with antibiotic therapy alone. Larger effusions require further evaluation with ultrasound and or chest CT to assess characteristics. If there are no high-risk features, a diagnostic thoracentesis should be performed. If there are high-risk features, including loculation, involvement of hemi half of the hemothorax, pleural thickening, or fluid analysis showing, pH, 7.2 glucose, 60 mg DL positive gram stain or culture, then the effusion is likely complicated and should be drained with a chest tube. Flow volume loops are essential in diagnosing fixed upper airway obstructions like tracheal stenosis or anterior mediastinal mass, which obstruct both expiration and inspiration. Small airway obstructive lung diseases, such as COPD, bronchiectasis, and asthma, exhibit unique scooped-out expiratory limb pattern, given obstruction more in expiration along with increased volume trapping. Paradoxical vocal cord motion can mimic asthma symptoms which aren't improved with inhalers along with inspiratory strider and normal PFTs. So, we should ask to get flow volume graph and diagnostic test is laryngoscopy. Speech therapy is the first-line management, offering effective relief and improving patient outcomes. Variable extrathoracic obstructions, more during inspiration, such as laryngomalacia or vocal cord paralysis, show limited flow during inspiration in the graph shown. Chronic eosinophilic pneumonia is a condition marked by respiratory symptoms such as fever, weight loss, and shortness of breath. It is characterized by eosinophilia in blood and bowel. It has peripheral pulmonary infiltrates visible on chest imaging. Eosinophilic pneumonia respond dramatically to glucocorticoids. Asbestosis is caused by the chronic inhalation of asbestos fibers, often found in occupational settings like shipyards and construction sites. Patients typically present with progressive dyspnea on exertion and a dry cough. Imaging reveals interstitial fibrosis, particularly in the lower lung zones, and pleural plaques, which are pathognomonic. Pulmonary function tests show a restrictive pattern and reduced DLCO. Benign asbestos-related pleural effusion is small, usually less than 500 melothelous with eosinophil predominance, and is found in early asbestosis. Silicosis results from inhaling crystalline silica dust, common in occupations such as mining and stone cutting. Imaging often shows upper lobe predominant nodular opacities and eggshell calcification of lymph nodes. This condition can lead to progressive massive fibrosis over time. There's an increased risk of tuberculosis in individuals with silicosis, necessitating TB screening and lung cancer screening to manage potential complications. Central sleep apnea can occur in patients with pulmonary congestion from congestive heart failure, secondary to compression of vagus nerve, often presenting with Cheney-Stokes breathing patterns, which is rapid breathing followed by apnea. Unlike obstructive sleep apnea, central sleep apnea is characterized by normal BMI and neck circumference. In pregnant females, polysomnography is recommended to evaluate OSA when hypertension is present before starting blood pressure medications. Nocturnal asthma exacerbation usually between 2 to 4 a.m. and has cough with wheeze, need to ask scheduler steroid formoterol inhaler. The step-up strategy for asthma treatment in adults involves a progressive approach based on symptom frequency and severity. Starting with ICS formoterol PRN for less frequent symptoms, the strategy advances to schedules ICS formoterol and additional therapies like LAMA or biologics for uncontrolled asthma. When discharging adults with acute asthma exacerbations, a medication regimen including oral glucocorticoids for 5 to 10 days is recommended. Step-up asthma therapy should be reassessed after 2 to 4 weeks, adjusting inhaled corticosteroids and beta agonists as needed. Controlling asthma during pregnancy is particularly important, requiring careful use of step-up therapy and scheduled inhalers to manage symptoms effectively. Reactive airway dysfunction syndrome is a non-immune asthma-like illness that occurs after exposure to a pulmonary irritant. Pulmonary function testing may reveal obstruction, and methicoline challenge testing can help establish the diagnosis. Obesity hypoventilation syndrome is defined by daytime hypercapnia and hypoxemia in obese patients, without other causes of hypoventilation. Arterial blood gas analysis is crucial for identifying alveolar hypoventilation, 
especially in patients with unexplained hypoxemia or signs of core pulmonale. Aspirin-exacerbated respiratory disease is characterized by Samter's triad, which includes asthma, chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyposis, and sensitivity to aspirin or NSAIDs. Ingestion can lead to acute asthma exacerbation and other symptoms like flushing of the face. Avoiding NSAIDs and considering leukotriene receptor antagonists like Montelukast or aspirin desensitization are key strategies for managing this condition effectively. Thank you.